I am 22 years old and I just graduated college from Gonzaga University. I am a sarcoma survivor for a sarcoma survivor for over 10 years now. Um, I was diagnosed when I was 11 and went through treatment um, up past my 12th birthday. Um, I had a sarcoma of the pelvis, nine months of chemotherapy, uh, radiation, numerous surgeries. Um, I've had surgery since treatment finished, but all in all, uh, I'm, I'm happy and I'm healthy now. And I'm here to share part of my story um, with other sarcoma survivors, patients, caregivers, um, and talk a little bit about what that experience was like. I think one of the main things I struggled with after um, I finished treatment was having to navigate this world with a lot more stress um, and some impaired resources. Um, one of the things I found very stressful was uh, I went into treatment and I was really into sports. I was very athletic as a kid. Um, and I came out after having had this huge surgery and rigorous treatment and I was no longer that uh, ath athlete. And so trying to find myself in a world where I kind of had lost something that meant a lot to me um, was difficult and something I struggled with for a long time. But I was ultimately able to find things I was passionate about um, through a lot of hard work and determination and a lot of support from other people. And I am very, very happy with where I'm at. Um, I'm able to do things at a level that I'm proud of and can be happy at. I'm able to exercise and uh, stay active and healthy. I, love school, I have great friends. And so um, this life after diagnosis and, and after treatment, um, it's difficult at times, but uh, it has never prevented me from, from living a happy and, and fulfilled life. One of, the, one of the things that can be pretty difficult, especially during treatment and immediately after um, for me as a kid, uh, particularly was this feeling of isolation. Um, not many kids have to grow up with uh, having endured an adult disease like cancer. Um, you learn about the world very quickly. You start to have a worldview different um, from most of your peers. Um, and you've kind of endured this thing and you carry this load that nobody else can really understand. Um, I mean, even adults who have to go through cancer treatment, they weren't kids trying to figure out who they are and develop a sense of self when they, when they had cancer. It's, it's very different when you're a child. So um, definitely some feelings of isolation during treatment and immediately after. But as I said at the beginning, um, these are all things that you learn to grapple with through time and ultimately work themselves out as long as you stay committed and, and you seek out support. One thing that I found to be really helpful with that was uh, allowing as many people as you can into your experience with cancer as possible. Um, allowing visitors at the hospital, um, even when your energy is low, it can be good just to have them around because afterwards, once the treatment finishes and, and you go back to your life, you're not gonna have many people who were there for it and, then, and who understand what it was like to go through that. And so by allowing people by allowing visitors to come see you and be with you and support you, um, you're broadening that network of, of uh, close others who have been there since the beginning, who have seen it, who, who have a, a baseline understanding of um, what that experience was like, and that can help uh, significantly with feelings of isolation. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about was just what, what I did to reduce stress during treatment, because that's, uh, I mean, that's kind of what everyone wants to know. You go through this disease, like how do you even how do you cope with that? And I think there's definitely some tangible things that you can do. Um, first, I think it's allowing people to help. Um, I, for one, definitely struggle with that. Uh, there's definitely a sense of pride that you wanna take care of things on your own, but the more and more you can allow people to help, um, it not only can reduce your stress by allowing them to do some of the hard things for you, but you're helping others around you because people want to help. People want to be there for you. They want to uh, feel like they're doing something. And to the degree that you can allow them to do something for you, no matter how small, they will in turn feel better about themselves. So you can kind of look at it as um, helping others help you, um, helping yourself by helping others. 
Um, another thing that also really helped, um, well, this is something I've learned since, but meditation I think can be really, really helpful. There's a lot of apps out there like Headspace and Breathe um, and meditation can uh, be a great resource for kind of uh, uh, present moment awareness, um, self-compassion, uh, and, and just uh, gaining some broader perspective of things. Um, it can also be really useful for coping with pain. So I think meditation, I'm a huge proponent of uh, meditation. So I would definitely encourage you to take that up if you're looking for ways to reduce stress. Um, and then I think the last thing is just seeing everything as a learning opportunity. When you're diagnosed with cancer, um, it, you often ask yourself questions or this was my experience of like, why me? Why is this happening? Um, how can I avoid this? And you soon realize a lot of the pain that you're going to go through is unavoidable. Um, but uh, if you're able to start to see everything as a learning opportunity, then the bad things aren't just simply bad. They also have the secondary component to them where they're actually valuable and they become something that you can learn from. And so uh, going through treatment and after treatment and everything that comes with cancer, I always try to see it as a learning opportunity. Some advice that I would give to a newly diagnosed sarcoma patient or their parent is if I was talking to their parent, I would, I would tell them to treat them just as you would any other child. You just might have to be a little bit more uh, understanding, patient, and uh, present with your child. I think definitely patience is, is important because uh, things are tough and they can, the cancer will slow you down and it'll, it'll knock you down, but it takes a while to get back up sometimes. And so having some patience with your child. Um, learning to advocate for your child. I think parents, uh, I think that's a natural instinct for a lot of parents, but what's not natural is uh, learning to teach your child how to advocate for themselves. Um, like I said, cancer is a learning opportunity, um, everything that comes with it. And so as much as you can take it and try to teach your child valuable lessons, um, like advocating for their self um, with a doctor, being able to communicate how they're feeling, um, their thoughts and their emotions is super, super important. Um, and I think especially for older kids, uh, they want I mean, they're going through this adult disease, so they want to be treated as adults. Um, and that can be especially meaningful for them when their parents start to do so. And then the last thing, I think, are, are two more things. One, when, when you're diagnosed, it's kind of this feeling of having this, the rug ripped out from under you and you start to spiral and, and, and feel like you have no sense of control over things. And I think that's just innate to the, to the cancer experience. I think everybody goes through that. I think at the very beginning though, um, it's important to hear that that does happen to everyone and that that will uh, change. Uh, over time, you start to develop a habit, you start to develop a routine, um, you start to learn how to deal with these things and, and the language, the medical language, the hospital language, you get the lingo down um, and you just become better equipped to, to handle the day-to-day -day life of cancer treatment and the cancer experience. And so I think being patient with yourself, being patient with the doctors um, and having some self-compassion can be really useful um, for dealing with that uh, sense of lost control. Um, and then the last piece of advice I would give would be to start preparing for life after cancer early on. And so you can do that by, I, I think one of the most important things to do is to meet with a psychologist, a social worker, a therapist, um, for caregivers and for the child, um, doing a, a workup of uh, a, a psyche eval to see where you're at beforehand and to see, and that'll allow you to see um, the progression post-treatment and where you go and, and to target areas that may have been um, impacted by the cancer experience. So uh, you gotta look long-term and uh, prepare because you're going to want to live your fullest life once all this is over. And so it can be really helpful to um, set up those resources that'll make that possible. So my son was diagnosed in March uh, 2016. Uh, he had self-identified a small bump on his head. And at first he had me look at it. And we thought it was a pimple or we thought it was something 
uh, wrong with um, maybe an ingrown hair or something. It was really small and tiny. And he said, Mom, I didn't do anything. I don't know what happened, but um, I just feel like there's this bump. And so he went and had it looked at and it was nothing. And he said, well, I, I hit my head with the uh, weightlifting because he was very strong and, and worked out and everything. And so we thought, okay, well, it's a bump. And then the bump started to grow and we thought it got infected and it was swollen. So he went to the doctor and they tried to extract um, fluid out of it. And the doctor told him, well, if it gets any bigger, go to the emergency, I can't tell anything. So the thing, uh, two weeks evolved and I went to some personal friends and I said, my son has a bump on his head and we're really worried. And it was by then it was about this size. And they said, well, if it's on the outside of the head and not on the inside, I wouldn't worry about it. It's just a skull thing. but. His wife happened to be in the office that day and she ordered some scans and we saw that it was all on the outside and in the inside and we saw that it was a tumor and we were going to have it done locally, um, taken out by the local brain surgeon. He said it's something he's never seen before and he thought it was a sarcoma. Basically, by the time that my son was diagnosed, within a week he had a five and a half hour brain surgery and then they discovered that that was not the primary, that it had come from somewhere else. And when we found that information out, because after you know five and a half hours of surgery my son was fine he recovered quickly and within less than 10 hours he walked out carrying his bags out of the hospital with his you know bandage on his head and he was ready to go but we didn't know at that time that we were in for a very long fight we thought that they'd taken out the tumor and we were done we found out that it was an ewing sarcoma and we learned that ewing sarcoma is very rare and sarcomas are very rare and they're primarily in children. That's why he was misdiagnosed because at the time he was 27 years old. The thing about uh, the Ewings that is, I'd like to really share with families is that they have come a long way. When he was first diagnosed the first time, he was given one option, one option. This is it, we do it this way, this is the only way. And if he makes it, this is, he has a pretty good chance of survival and he did survive and he did do well and he's an older and stronger person. Now, when you, when you come up with uh, the disease, they are four and five options, which shows that uh, technology, which shows that science, which shows that um, their advancement in research is coming through, that there's so much more hope that if this cocktail doesn't work, then that cocktail might work or that cocktail might work. And they have more options to try and they have more solutions to try. Um, and that's just within the four years that we've been doing this. And so when he said, well, what will happen if this comes back? She says, well, we'll come back to the table and we have more options. We didn't have that when he got sick the first time. So I want to tell families and I want to support families in knowing that, that they've come a long way, that, that cancer has come, cancer research has come a long way. And um, when Jonathan first got sick, the survival rate uh, increase was 1% annually. That means that they were improving cancer research by 1%. And now it's two and a half percent. And I know that doesn't sound a lot, like a lot, but in my lifetime, I'm 56 years old. That means that cancer research and cancer survival rates have improved by 56%. Well, now it's 2.5%. So 2.5, 5%, 7.5. It's the odds are getting better and better. Now, uh, sarcomas are very, very aggressive cancers and, and they usually come on young people um, and if they come in, they usually are quiet. And when people get it, they, they're surprised. But I do wanna encourage people to really know that there's a lot of hope and there's a lot, of, a lot going out there. And um, the lady that, uh, her name is Katie Alberts and she is Jonathan's um, current doctor because Hopkins is kind of the primary guy overlooking all of sarcomas now for the Pacific Northwest. They've made it their mission to find cures and they really are aggressive about doing it. And, I know we hear a lot of negative things in the news about cancer research and, and the greediness of uh, pharmaceuticals and things, but in my experience with my son, I have found that uh, the research is, is, especially with immunotherapy coming through, there's just so much more hope. There's just so much more positive support and um, some positive things to look forward to than just the negative um, diagnoses that we used to get uh, when he first got sick. Helpful was friends. Um, he, he needed his parents, he really did. Even though he's an adult, he was in, it was hard for him because he was an adult and he'd been living independently, but he needed his parents, of course, and we were there. But his friends, friends would, uh, now again, so the first time he was sick was before COVID and now he's sick and you can't have friends, but they do FaceTime and Zoom and, 
and they play video games together. But when the friends would come visit and stuff, there were times when he was so down and so depressed. And all I did was I would call his best friend and I would say, hey, can you come in? Um, I, I, can't, I can't reach John. And his friends would be there or he would get a group and all of a sudden four or five guys would show up. They'd drive down from Bellingham and surprise him with dinner and he was, it would lift his spirit so high. So parents can only do so much. And then family, friends, peers, I think that was the key for him, um, that they would lift his spirits up and they would keep him going. Now it's hard because of COVID and he's isolated because of his, everybody's isolated, but he's even more so um, because of the transplant. He has to be really mindful and where some of us can go shopping with masks and stuff, he still has to remain at home. So it is very isolating and very lonely. So sometimes he shuts down, but I've always asked his friends to keep texting him, keep commenting, keep sending videos, keep emailing, keep sending requests, keep inviting him to the video games and stuff. And then some days when he's ready, he will join in. So it's like, you're always there around him. And when he's ready, you're there. Because if you send invitations and he doesn't respond and then you disappear, when he's ready, there's nobody there. So it's it's a hard, it's, and I've talked to all our friends and family and me and my husband and everything. We constantly, on a regular basis, continue to take um, an effort to reach out to him. Now, when he, right now he's doing radiation and in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna go back down and be with him because as radiation continues, the numbers A and C go down, you get more fatigued, you get overwhelmed, You driving may not be safe. Uh, you have to keep everything really clean. He can do that now because he's strong, but radiation zaps you. It's like a sunburn and then it feels like um, you've been burnt on the stove. And so after a while, you keep getting that area where it's burnt and burnt. You know, you it just, it's after a while, it's very hard. And six and a half weeks is a very long time. So then I go back down and I live with him. And so we're around him, but we try to give him that space when he's stronger. But when we're not there, I ask his brother, I ask his friends, I ask his family to constantly stay in touch. He may or may not respond because he's tired or sleeping a lot. Sometimes he sleeps up to 16 hours a day. But when he's ready and he needs somebody, we have always been there. And um, so it's our effort. That's the energy we put out. So when he's ready, he can just answer. And, and that's really important because people don't understand how exhausting it is. I can tell you, new families that when your patient, your friend, your child, your spouse, whatever has cancer, the fight is as if you are running a marathon every day. The energy that you exert every day is as the same as if you ran a marathon. Now I ran one marathon in my life and I may run one more because my son wants to run one. <laughs> But they are, to train for them, one is exhausting. And then when you do one, it's so overwhelming. That's, you know, a lot of time. Um, unless you're an elite runner and you know, it's only a two and a half thing and then you're sore for a week. But for most of us, it's a lot of effort. So to get through this cancer, it's a lot of effort. And then when they're not in treatment, the recovery is just pure exhaustion. So do not get upset if you send emails, letters, cards, gifts, and people don't write back and say thank you. They are so tired. They are appreciative. They're grateful. They, the, the effort to read the card is about maybe it for the day. And it's really hard for, for young families to understand that. But um, once you get into it and you understand that and you can appreciate the effort that's involved, you can imagine what heroes each one of these cancer patients are. So the parents are the driving force or the caregivers and if you can stay upbeat and do a lot of self-care take care of yourself be be as well as you can be that energy vibrates off of you and then that cancer patient can see that you're healthy and that gives them hope if you're walking around like this and life sucks and your and life is miserable and your child is sick they're going to feed off that if we can get our mind to be positively thinking positive thoughts and we can be Surrounding ourselves with positive energy and positive music and positive friends and stuff like that, we do better. The research shows we do better. I'm Patty Reed Williams. I am the president of the Northwest Sarcoma Foundation, but I am here today as a patient. Um, I am a 17 year survivor of chondrosarcoma. Um, 
and wanted to just talk a little bit about that. I um, am a family physician, so was in the middle of practicing when this all started. Um, I had a full spectrum practice, including obstetrics during that time period. I also had two kids and a husband. Um, so I had a 12 year old and a 15 year old when this diagnosis was made and um, they took it very differently, but um, it certainly changed their lives. Anyway, so my uh, diagnosis with it was a chondrosarcoma and it was in my left thigh. I had to have surgery to have that removed and then an allograft, which is a piece of somebody else's bone that they've donated um, was put in place of my bone and it was all put together with steel and screws. And um, then I had to heal from that. Amazingly, it looks like it's my own bone right now that maybe I had a bad break in that area. It's kind of cool, but I was on crutches for about a year and was in physical therapy for about eight years to help walk again. Um, I couldn't get my gait correct so that it wouldn't hurt my back. So that was a long process. I had great surgeons, but um, there wasn't a lot of guidance as to what to do after you had the surgery, besides go see the physical therapist. And to be honest, I went through four physical therapists because many of them didn't know what to do with me. In fact, I had one of them actually say to me, I don't know how to make you walk at this point in time. So I had to um, pursue things on my own. And I'm a healthcare professional, so it, it was um, an interesting process to try to figure out who to go to. I think it would have been helpful to have a little bit more guidance about how to make this leg get better and um, how to, learn how to walk a little bit faster rather than kind of trial and error a little bit. I, I, I must say that I had great health care, but I just um, didn't get a lot of guidance during that time period. So I did do my own research when I got my diagnosis. And of course I knew what sarcoma was, um, although I tended to ignore it when it was pointed out to me because I couldn't believe that I had that. I was a very healthy 45 year old at the time and exercise three, four or five times a week. So it really came out of the blue. It certainly disrupted our lives. My husband had quit his job to go into private practice. So he actually went back to his previous job in a little different capacity and started working again so that um, they would have insurance in case I didn't make it. My kids um, took things pretty hard. Um, my oldest daughter reacted by wanting to be the mom in the family. And uh, my youngest daughter just kind of decided to ignore it, but I think it really did affect her because um, when she went to college and then she went to grad school, she actually got her degree in biology and genetics at MD Anderson, which is a cancer center. So she did her research on cancer. And I think looking back, it would have been nice to have a little bit of help with my kids as to how to help them get through it and um, I think it was a little compounded by the fact that we would just had a friend, very close friend, that my oldest daughter was going over to their house every night after play practice because she was in the pit orchestra and um, she watched this person pass, basically get sicker and sicker and sicker and then eventually pass away and her funeral was about a week before I had surgery. So they were, tr she was especially traumatized, I think, by the fact that she w was really afraid that I was going to die. So it would have helped to have somebody to talk to about that and how they dealt with their kids. I wish that I had um, taken them to counseling during that time period. So they had a place to talk, a safe place to talk about what it meant to have a mother with cancer. Um, I couldn't make it to some of their activities. I mean, I worked in Issaquah anyway, so I wasn't making it all the time anyway, but um, it, it, it was worrisome to them, I think, um, that I, you know, had a pretty significant illness 
um, and that I wasn't myself and and that they had to do some of the work around the house because I couldn't pick things up and be on crutches and be non-weight bearing. Um, in fact, my oldest daughter told me at one point in time, she was irritated with me and said, uh, mom, you just need to go back to work and boss those people around. <laughs> so um, um, I think it would have been really helpful for them if they could have gone through some counseling at that point in time. And maybe just as a family in general as to how to deal with the fact that I, I did everything. I did a lot. I'm sorry, my husband was super helpful and very involved, but um, I did a lot. And so I um, couldn't do any of it. I couldn't mow the lawn. I couldn't, um, I couldn't always get out and do stuff with them. So um, it would have been, I think that would have been the most helpful thing is for them to get some counseling as well as um, for myself and my husband so that we could help them. And, and really that was never offered throughout the process at that point in time. I think really mental health is much more um, available. Mental health care is much more available at this point in time. I finally um, said to Dr. Conrad, you know, I've been through an awful lot. Maybe I should see a counselor. And so um, I did see somebody at SCCA, but it, they said, you seem to be dealing with it just fine. So. <laughs> um, yeah, the isolation is significant because you're in pain for a long time and um, you accommodate everything that you do trying to, uh, to take care of, to be able to actually do those things and um, to make sure that you don't run out of pain medication, which for me it was anti-inflammatories, but um, and like at work, I um, it was hard for me to go in and out of a room to pick stuff off of a printer. So my uh, I carried around a phone so that I could call um, call the medical assistant so she could pick up the paperwork off the printer and bring it to me. Um, I wore a fanny pack so that I could carry my prescription pad and pins and everything with me because I was uh, non-weight bearing. So you had to put all your, your, all your hands were taken up with using the crutches. Really the thing that helped the most and reduced the stress of going through it um, was all the love and care that I got from my family and friends. My clinic partners were very helpful and accommodated all the deficiencies when I did return to work. Um, my, my two sisters and my mother and father um, all came and helped, helped with the kids and then um, helped try to get me put back together. I think when you just get this kind of diagnosis, you just kind of try to power through everything. Like you just have to beat it. Um, and so there is some kind of aftershock afterwards when you actually do beat it, but I'm not sure I completely believed that I beat it. I probably didn't believe I beat it for about six or seven years. Um, when Dr. Conrad asked me to be a part of the board, that's when I went, oh, I must, I must, I must be able to, I'm gonna survive this, right? Because he wouldn't ask me to be on the board if I wasn't going to survive. And I actually was part of an initial meeting um, at a facility in, I believe it was Fremont. Um, I was still on crutches at the time, getting people together and talking about starting this organization. And then became more active a couple, probably a year or two later when we had the first walk. I missed the first walk because my father was in the hospital, but um, I have been to every single one of them since that time and been to all the galas also. I, I like the events. I wish that they'd been around when I was going through the actual process because I think it's nice to see other people and to talk to other people and share stories and share survival and um, the fact that they uh, can walk and run and exercise and do all their favorite things. Mm -hmm.